Thank you all for being here and welcome. My name is Stephanie Carana, I'm CEO of Axum Collaborative, and I'm delighted we are here together on this special occasion to explore AI in education, specifically inclusive innovation for student success. I would like to welcome you all to Sanders Theater. It's one of Harvard's largest classrooms and performance venues. I have to admit, I feel a little bit like Hermione from Harry Potter. The stage can just feel like I landed in Hogwarts. Today, this place does feel magical and imaginative. I've always believed that magic doesn't require wands or spells or potions. All it truly needs are people to experience it with the imagination to believe in a better future. Today, this space is a space to share ideas, to learn from each other, and to be inspired to try new things. It comes alive because of the people who come here from across generations, educational backgrounds, and interests to take on bold new ideas. I've lived on the Harvard campus for many years, and I remember when Mulala Yousrafzai was 16 years old and was here in 2013, and she came to Sanders Theater and she created magic. The place was silent, still. And add to it a single storyteller. And as she began sharing her story, the space transformed. She took us to her village where she grew up, and she embodied the idea that education has the potential to change lives, communities, and societies. Through the power of words and the imagination of those sitting in the audience, we were transported. No special effects, no high-end technologies, just a human connection and the limitless desire of this young woman who was almost assassinated for seeking knowledge. And she said something I think we can all hold on to. Let us remember one book, one pen, one child, and one teacher can change the world. Let us stand up for our rights and let's fight. And today we have an opportunity to think boldly to help make a difference. We have innovative leaders from all over this nation and from incredible institutions, including several HBCUs, UNCF, Arizona State, Partners for Education and Advancement, and Khan Academy, our collaborators, along with Harvard and MIT. We welcome people from our community, from across Boston and Cambridge and beyond. You are all people who care deeply about K through 12 education and post-secondary education in all of its forms and the connection to learning outcomes and how education creates possibilities for better lives and communities. At Axum Collaborative, we too are activating a deep mission born from the visionary work of Harvard and MIT that launched MOOCs, our massive open online education courses through edX over a decade ago to provide quality courses to learners everywhere, reaching over 55 million learners. And these visionary leaders, some of whom are in the audience today, realize that making courses accessible isn't enough. We can do more to reach the 40 million talented students who stopped out of post-secondary education and have dangling degrees and no job to make ends meet. Chances are, you know someone who has yet to earn a degree despite their best efforts, having faced academic, personal, or economic barriers. Now, imagine a world where we create AI tools that help students have stronger K through 12 mastery of math, English, or data science. Or an AI co-pilot that can help students complete their post-secondary studies thanks to an AI tutor that's up at night when they are. Met with equal concerns um, are, is education, is generative AI really for everyone? Will learning be shortchanged, especially for those in under-resourced communities? Will biases that exist be accelerated by these tools that outpace us along with the policies and regulations? And who can afford it? Or who can afford it? When a bold new technology becomes ubiquitous, as generative AI has, we ask ourselves, what does it mean to activate ideas for everyone? Thus our theme, inclusive innovation for student success.
There's extraordinary promise in how generative AI can be a great equalizer in education, but how do we make that possible? My hope is that each of you here, as you listen and learn from these three incredible thought leaders, think deeply about what is possible in your context and what will matter most as we chart the future ahead, the future that has yet to be written. We can create magic, education is magic, but we don't need potions. We need people, imagination, and boldness. Bold choices create our futures, as Malala said. Let us make our future now, and let us make our dreams tomorrow's reality. Let's just dream with our eyes open. So, let me introduce you to three incredible thought leaders and activators who care deeply about how technology innovations can improve learning outcomes for students everywhere. They think outside traditional systems and approaches to drive breakthrough ideas that ripple outward for families and communities. So you have a treat today. You'll be hearing from three incredible leaders, Dr. Bridget Terry Long, who's Dean and SARS Professor of Education and Economics at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. She's an economist who focuses on the transition from high school to higher education and beyond. Her research examines the impact of factors such as affordability and economic preparation, academic preparation on college student outcomes. Cynthia Brazil is the Dean for Digital Learning at MIT and a professor of media arts and sciences at the MIT Media Lab, where she founded and directs the Personal Robots Group. She's also director of the MIT-wide initiative on responsible AI for social empowerment and education, known as RAISE a research and outreach, outreach effort that advances access and inclusivity in education to people of all ages and backgrounds with a focus on K through 12 in the workforce. And Sal Khan is the founder and CEO of Khan Academy, a nonprofit with the mission of providing free, world-class education for anyone, anywhere. And he's the founder of schoolhouse.world, Khan Lab School and Khan World School, all nonprofits focused on making world-class personalized mastery of education possible. So the way this is gonna go, Sal and Cynthia will each give presentations. So you'll hear from Sal and you'll hear from Cynthia. And then Cynthia will join the, the two of them on stage for a, a deeper conversation. Uh, do you have, you have questions? Um, the QA, um, uh, you can use this and uh, type in any questions you might have and we'll factor those into Bridget's um, Q&A. And we'll then conclude our time together. So with that, please give a very warm welcome to Sal Khan. Thank you, Stephanie. And let, let me apologize ahead of time. Uh, uh, horrible timing, I've lost my voice in the last, I don't think I'm sick. I, I was sick a couple weeks ago, but I've lost my voice, so, so bear with me. Um, but just to start off, uh, how many of y'all have used Khan Academy in some? How many of you don't know what it is? Okay, self-selecting crowd. Um, more relevant to AI, how many of y'all think that AI is going to be a net positive for humanity? How many of you think it's a net negative for humanity? Okay, a few, and a lot of people unsure. All right, well, I'm sure we're gonna have a lot of time to discuss that more, but I'm just gonna go really quick through a little bit of the narrative of how, what we're, how we're thinking about things, and then um, obviously uh, Cynthia's gonna talk, and we're gonna we'll open things up a little bit more. So um, some of y'all might be familiar with this. This is a paper that was published by Benjamin Bloom back in 1984. He framed it as the two sigma problem, and we'll talk in a second, whoops, We'll talk in a second while he, why he framed it as a problem. But what he tried to argue for in that paper is you, you, you take a, just a traditional bell curve, normal distribution of students, and he said if you allow them to have personalized tutoring in a mastery framework, mastery framework is just a fancy way of saying if they haven't learned it yet, keep working on it so that they can actually master it. Don't just move them forward like honestly most of the traditional academic system does. But he says if you, if you do that, at least in his fairly narrow assessment that he did, he saw two standard deviation improvement, which is dramatic. Um, that's like taking someone in the 50th percentile and getting them to the 95th or 96th percentile. Uh, and since then, there's been many 
many studies on it, not always quite that large of a, of a magnitude, but they all pointed in the same direction. The reason why he framed it as a problem is, well, it's like, well, we can't give everyone a personal tutor. We just don't have the resources for that. But he theorized that, well, maybe you could approximate some of it with technology. And this was him back in 1984 talking about that. And that's what that, that middle bell curve is. If with mastery learning, maybe you can get a standard deviation. And in a lot of ways, that's what Khan Academy has been working on for a very, very long time now. Uh, a lot of you all know how this all got started back in 2004. I, I was a year out of the business school right over here. I was working as an analyst at a hedge fund on Newberry Street. And um, my family, I just got married. My family was visiting. I was born and raised in New Orleans. My family was visiting me in Boston and just came out of conversation, my 12-year-old cousin Nadia was having trouble in math. So I said, hey Nadia, when you go back to New Orleans, I'm up for tutoring you every day after the markets close. She was up for it, uh, slowly but surely, she got caught up with her school, uh, at that, uh, with her class. At that point, I, I became what I call a tiger cousin. <laughs> I, I called up her, her school and I said, I really think Nadia Rahman should be able to retake the placement exam from last year. They said, who are you? I said, I'm her cousin. Then they let her. And the same Nadia, with just a little bit of tutoring, went from being essentially a, a remedial student to an advanced student. So I was hooked. I started working with her younger brothers. Word spreads in my family, free tutoring is going on. <laughs> and, and before I know it, I'm tutoring 10, 15 cousins, family, friends, uh, all over the country every day uh, after my, my hedge fund job. And I, 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 I saw uh, some, some common patterns and uh, my original background was in software. And I said, okay, maybe I can scale some of the things, the patterns uh, that I'm seeing that they had gaps in their knowledge. What if I allowed them to practice to fill in those gaps? What if I made tools for myself as, as a teacher? Uh, we eventually move out to Northern California. A friend suggested I make YouTube videos to supplement it. I said, that's a horrible idea. YouTube is for cats playing piano. It is not for serious math. Uh, but but I, I, I got over the idea that it was not mine, and, and I gave it a shot. Um, and, and my cousins famously told me they liked me better on YouTube than in person. <laughs> and, and, but what they were saying is they liked the on-demand, I, I think they were saying. They, 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 they liked um, not having to be embarrassed, and they still appreciated having me when they could. And, and what I realized starting from that moment when I was writing software and I was making videos all the way to you know 2009, I quit my day job and we start hiring a team, we, we brought philanthropists to the table, we were essentially trying to scale up what I was originally doing with Nadia. I did not know about Benjamin Bloom or this study back then, but we were essentially, you know, I, I started on that, that right side with a few of my cousins, and then we said, well, if we're gonna scale this to millions, or tens of millions and now hundreds of millions, well, maybe we could at least get to that, that first standard deviation. Now, that's all the background. Fast forward to last year, OpenAI reaches out to us. Well before ChatGPT comes out, well before any of this, I was curious but skeptical. I had paid attention to GPT-2, GPT-3. It was cool, but not, not something that I thought was ready for prime time. We saw what would eventually become GPT-4, and even though it had and frankly still has a lot of uh, rough spots to it, we said, wow, this, this feels like it could get us a lot closer uh, to, that, to that, last, um, that, that last standard deviation. Now, that was over a year ago, November, chat GPT comes out, and we all see this stuff happening. Where you know, it just gets launched. I remember I emailed, uh, I, I slacked uh, Sam and Greg at Open. I'm like, what's going on? You, you have us under an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. What have you launched? So we haven't launched anything. We just put a chat interface on top of uh, our model, our GPT 3.5, and the whole world has kind of exploded. And I was initially bummed. I said, I started reading headlines like this and saying, wow, people are going to throw out the baby with the bathwater because it's an inferior model. It was not built for education. It has no guardrails. Cheating is where everyone is gravitating to. Districts are banning it. And our team was working on it, and, but doing it in a way that would have the guardrails, wouldn't cheat, but help pedagogically do it, be a tutor for any student, being a teaching assistant for any teacher. In hindsight, I think this was a blessing uh, because then when we were able to launch as part of the GPT-4 launch earlier this year, it's almost like the education system had come around. They realized that they can't ignore it, but they wanted ways to make sure it's not cheating, make sure that, for especially under 18, there's ways to monitor, uh, maybe proactively make sure there's some guardrails in there, et cetera. 
So what I'm going to show you now is what we have been building and continue to build at an accelerating rate. And, and that's kind of a little bit of background for, I think, our conversation later on. So a lot of y'all might remember, if you uh, have, or maybe even some of y'all are still using, we have college level courses. Um, this is an exercise on Khan Academy. What's new is Khan Migo there. And a few guardrails. First of all, you see the conversation is recorded and viewable by your teacher for under 18 users. If the student says, tell me the answer, not going to tell them the answer. It's like, I'm your tutor. I'm here to help you. What do you think the next step should be? And then this, some of y'all who are into this might surprise you. The student's making a very common mistake. They're distributing the negative two only on the nine. They're not doing it on, on both numbers. And, and this isn't like a canned thing. This is you go to Conmigo and you just try it out. It, 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 it's not perfect at math, but it is surprisingly good at, for any of y'all, especially who've played with some of these models, even some of the more advanced models. But even more importantly, it's doing the pedagogically right thing. It's saying, what do you think is the next step? Can you explain your reasoning? And all of these were the gold standard of education, but there was no way that you could really do it at scale, frankly, but before now. And we could talk more about how we've been approaching this. Not just in math, this is coding on Khan Academy, the student's trying to get the clouds to part. So they start decrementing one variable, they got the left card to part, and they say, well, why is only the left cloud moving? And what's amazing is that it kind of understands at that level of abstraction. Even if you get rid of those comments on the left, it understands that those ellipses were to draw clouds, which is mind boggling to me. Um, but it's doing the same thing. And what I find amazing, I've, I've, worked, I do, I've used this with my own children, it's frankly, it's better at helping them with their coding than I am. Because if you've ever done that, you have to understand their code and be infinitely patient, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but but this, is, this is there for them. Um, this is on a Khan Academy video. And notice in all these situations, it has context of what the student is actually doing. But the age old question, why do I need to learn this? Khan Migo says, what do you care about? And then the student says, I want to be a professional athlete. And then Conmigo will connect this video, which is about the scale of, of things in science, to being a professional athlete. It'll help you understand how protein cells, proteins and molecules can interact and help you make better choices about nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. Another interesting thing is we've now just recently made it so Conmigo remembers that. It remembers that you want to be a professional athlete so that later it can bring that into other things. But we've also made that transparent to the student so that it can modify things. It's like that wasn't an appropriate inference or I've now changed my career goals, whatever it might be. But so we're trying to introduce this notion of, 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 of memory. Now, we launched in March. We immediately started bringing it into schools. Um, and this is some of our early testimonials that we've been hearing from kids. Oh, is there sound? It, it knows a summary. It knows many different things. And it knows Spanish, Portuguese, and English. And it knows it's really smart, but it doesn't know everything. It helps me with everything. And I like what I like about it is my is that it helps me write like stories. And it's so amazing. It just helped me out with it. It didn't give me the answer, but it helped me out get the answer. I feel like it's like a tutor, you know, like. Oh, uh, a non-expense paid tutor. And all those young people there in Newark, New Jersey, where you're going to hear more. There, there's some good stuff happening in Newark, New Jersey. Um, so everything I've just shown you is traditional tutoring in some way, shape, or form. I think there's more to be done to make it even better. But then we quickly realized that it could definitely transcend even what I could do with Nadia back in 2004. This is an example. You can talk to simulations of literary characters. So here, the, talk to Eeyore the donkey. Oh, hello there, it's me, Eeyore. Not that anyone would notice, but since you're here, what would you like to talk about? Why are you so pessimistic? Well now, isn't that a question? I suppose it's just my nature, you see. Some donkeys are born with a sunny disposition. Others, well, we see the thistles more than the roses. But that's life, isn't it? We can't all be tiggers bouncing about. Now what about you? Do you find yourself more of a tigger or an Eeyore in your own life? And so you might notice, any of y'all who've interacted with these models, they tend to be very transactional, but we've definitely been trying to give it more personality uh, and, and, and to make it drive conversations and get to you know, pe pedagogically uh, interesting places with, with the students. We have talked to literary characters and, and other things. 
This is students can get into a debate with the AI. Uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback actually from high school and college students especially that they like debating in a safe environment. They take one side of the argument, the AI takes the other side of the argument. Here they're debating about whether student debt should be canceled. Um, and, and after a few interactions, it actually can give the student feedback on how they might have been able to make their arguments better. So once again, transcending uh, what you might have historically been able to do uh, definitely at, at scale. Very few kids are actually getting these types of interactions even in, in physical environments. This is something we haven't launched yet, but it's, we think it's going to build directly to address not only the cheating issue, but even a more important issue, we think, which is making sure people have more support when writing. Writing is infamously hard to get consistent feedback, and we know to get good at anything, you got to get a lot of good, high-quality, consistent feedback. So this right over here is, we're going to launch in a few weeks, um, where a student kind of on a, like a, imagine you're writing a, with, on a, a, like a, a Google Doc, uh, but the AI can highlight parts of the passage and start threads on it with you about how you might want to improve uh, your actual writing. And once again, it's not doing the essay for the student, but it's acting as an ethical coach. Now I know what some of y'all are thinking, well what's still to stop a student from going to chat GPT or one of these essay mills on the internet and paying someone to write their essay for them? And the reality is, is what's going to, where we're going with this and where our hope is to launch this by next back to school, teachers are going to assign through Conmigo and tell Conmigo how much support to give the student. Students are going to be able to work on the essay with the AI, then the AI is going to report back to the teacher, not just the output and maybe even a preliminary assessment on how the student did based on a rubric, but also, hey, we, it took us four hours, they had trouble with the thesis statement initially, we eventually got there, I helped them here or there, here's the whole transcript. And if a, which by the way is great for the teacher to know how their students are, are, are handling the assignments, but if a student goes to chat GPT or some other tool and copies and pastes the essay in, Conmigo is going to tell the teacher, I don't know where this essay came from, it's kind of shady. Um, you might want to look into this. By the way, it's not consistent with the type of writing that the student's done in class. So not only will, I think, generative AI not cheat, it could actually undermine an age-old cheating issue that existed well before chat GPT, but even more importantly, su finally support teachers and students uh, in ways that was previously very, very resource intensive and people weren't able to do it. Now, uh, this is a uh, American history exercise on Khan Academy, and everything I showed you is from a student's point of view. This is to show that there's a teacher mode. So if, a, if, a, th th if someone in student mode says, tell me the answer, as we just showed you, it's not going to tell you the answer. But then if you switch from student mode to teacher mode, as they just did, tell me the answer, it acts as a super teacher's guide, a teacher's assistant, for, and we could talk more about that. But let's say the teacher says, give me a good lesson hook, make it exciting. Absolutely, how about starting the lesson with a short role play activity? Divide your students into groups and assign each group a different country involved in the Spanish-American War. Ask them to imagine they're diplomats. It, you know, we spent a lot of time, and you know, this isn't something where we just told GPT-4, make a good lesson plan. We, we spent a lot of time with experts, making sure it's pedagogically sound, it's anchored on stuff, so it's not hallucinating. But we really think this could save teachers hours and hours and hours of, of, of time here. And the last thing I'll show you is something that's we're, we're a few months away from, but we're already prototyping it. We realize there's no reason that Conmigo should be limited to Khan Academy. So we're now thinking about how Conmigo can essentially be with a student or be with a teacher wherever they go. And this, is, this example is going to be a teacher, and here a teacher is on Wikipedia, but they can now anchor on the Wikipedia content to summarize it, refresh their own content. In this case, they're gonna create a lesson plan. Uh, and this is using the lesson plan tool that we have for teachers where it'll create the lesson plan and then they can edit it with the AI. So it's not just a uh, text-based thing. So we're realizing there's a lot of potential with, with different interfaces that you could do here. But you could imagine a student doing this. Imagine a seven-year-old reading an article in the New York Times. Maybe they need it at a different reading level. Maybe some of the content isn't appropriate. Maybe you take out the ads. Um, maybe you put some guardrails on there. You know, one way to think about it, uh, you know, we already have all these AIs that are working for social media companies, that are working for search engines, that are working on their objective functions, trying to keep us watching, trying to keep us clicking on things. What if we had AIs on our side that are trying to protect us, that are trying to make sure that we're focusing on things that are good for us, focusing on things that are good for our children, and then also, especially for kids, able to report back to parents and teachers uh, to give them a better understanding of what their, their students are doing. 
So big picture, I, I, I generally think that that two sigma problem, that there's actually the potential over the next five years or so to make it a solution. There's a big laundry list of, of things that we're continuing to work on. So this becomes a better and better, you know, things like memory and, and, and speech and, you know, we could go on and on in the list. But obviously now there's a lot of conversation, AI good, AI bad, I started with that. And there's a lot of areas that I'm very worried about AI. I'm worried what totalitarian governments could do with it in terms of surveillance. I'm worried with criminal organizations are going to do with it. I'm afraid of misinformation on our elections. All of the above, super scary. But in the education space, I'm pretty confident that as long as we take a pre appropriate guardrails, we have a good shot. And not only do we have a good shot, but I think it's an imperative because AI, we know that there's an industrial era labor pyramid. Uh, you know, at the bottom you have, let's call it labor, manual labor. Middle, you have kind of an information processing, white collar jobs, and at the top of that industrial age labor pyramid, you have the doctors, the lawyers, the engineers, the entrepreneurs, the academics. Well, we know what's about to happen to those bottom two layers. Uh, robotics, and I'm gonna hear more about that, and, and, and large language models can now start doing a lot of the, the paperwork that a lot of white collar jobs were all about before. And that's all gonna happen where, as we're gonna become a much more productive society. So we have really two choices. We either, all of that productivity is going to accrue to that very small top of the pyramid, in which case the only stable scenario is some form of massive redistribution. But even that's not, a, I think, a good scenario because people don't want redistribution. They want purpose, they want meaning, they want to be able to contribute to each other. So as far as I'm concerned, our only option to have a non-dystopian reality is to, to, to try like hell, uh, to get as many people as possible to get to that top of the pyramid. And if we do so, I think we have a shot of inverting that labor pyramid and making it so that everyone, you know, right now it might be 5% of people that you think could start the next tech company or write the next great novel or find the cure for cancer. But what if we could make that 80 or 90% of people? Thank you. All right, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be joining here at here today. Let me get my slides up. So um, I wanna talk about AI and design for equitable learning. What I wanted to do was to deepen and expand uh, the great themes that Sal talked about from two different perspectives. So one perspective is how AI can help us learn, this is what Sal talked about, but looking at a very different uh, age group, a very different learner. So young children, we're talking kids before they can read, before they can write, before they can type. Obviously this is a very different positioning and design challenge of how you design an AI to help young children learn. And then the second perspective is how can we help children learn about AI? We know AI is pervading all kinds of digital tools and services that we use. And with that, it's changing what it means to be digital literate and a digital citizen. So AI literacy, I would argue, is actually for all children, not just for kids wanting to go into computer science. So from those two perspectives, I wanna to hope to tee up the conversation we'll have in our Q&A with, with Bridget and Sal. So first of all, early childhood education. Okay, so why, I, I am at the Media Lab, I direct the Personal Robots Group, why am I interested in early childhood education? So first of all, what's a social robot? Okay, so just kind of get you in the right kind of, kind of idea space, you know, think back to Star Wars, think back to droids, R2-D2, C-3PO, and you're kind of in the vicinity of like what we actually try to do in my lab. So we're talking about robots, physical robots, that can interact with people uh, that are socially and emotionally intelligent to collaborate with us, to do all kinds of cool things with us. So that's, that's what our research agenda uh, is about. So when you think about the challenge of designing an autonomous social robot that can actually interact and play in meaningful ways with young children to promote their learning. It's a pretty hard technical challenge when you think about it. You know, it's a great way to think about how do we advance the social emotional intelligence of AI. But there's also a bigger societal reason why we really wanted to look at early childhood education. And the question here is can we harness AI to be part of a solution that is scalable, affordable, 
equitable, high quality, early childhood education so every child can start kindergarten ready to learn. That is not the reality today. There's a significant disparity between kindergarten readiness of children growing up in more affluent households, affluent communities versus those coming from lower uh, economic communities. And to pretty significant consequences. So this has been well studied. There's all kinds of statistics. You know, children who do not receive a high quality early childhood education or more likely for things like dropping out of high school, teenage pregnancy, and even the 70% being arrested for violent crimes, like holy moly, right? If you do receive a high quality early child education, there's a lot of benefits, higher job, you know, paying jobs and so forth, going to college. So this is a big question of, of social equity that starts like when kids are very, very young. And then kind of the double whammy is when you look at the impact of COVID, this just got even worse. And not only did the achievement gap get worse, teachers are suffering from burnout, they're leaving the profession. So what can we do? What can we do? Can AI be potentially a part, a part of making this vision possible? So at the Media Lab, we do a lot of work in how we think about cutting edge technology, but also human-centered design practices. And I think there's more and more opportunity for how we bring these together in a much more intimate way. So we firmly believe that you do not design at people or for people, you design with people. We've been at this, let's call it this kind of domain challenge for, for quite some time, like about 10 years. And through this time, we have engaged with schools, two particular uh, uh, regions, in Boston public schools, schools that have a high percentage of English language learning children, and also in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, in a collaboration with Georgia State University, so at-risk children, uh, urban black uh, communities. We've gone into these classrooms, we've engaged with teachers, with parents, with students, to really try to understand the context, thinking about the critical role that parents play and early childhood gains for the children in the home environment, to think holistically in a 360 way about how can we really design an A system that can make sense uh, for this, this challenge, where we are designing and innovating on many, many different layers, right? So kind of on the more technical, what's inside the robot layer, you know, we do a lot of psychology studies, we do a lot of observations to try to understand people and AI in real world context, in schools and at homes. We do a lot of work in design of the, of the experience. You know, how do you design a robot that is well matched to how young children actually learn? It's very social, it's playful, it's emotional, it's in person, right? How do we do that? And this, of course, informs and drives a lot of how, how we define what the algorithmic machine learning challenges are. How do we want to advance AI, the social and emotional intelligence of AI, that makes sense in these contexts? When you start to add in personalization, we do a lot of work in machine learning and reinforcement learning so the robots can learn from their interactions with children directly. That, in some sense, the AI becomes part of, of the design loop because it's changing the robot's behavior, it's changing the content and so forth. And then, of course, this constant prototyping, iteration, testing, evaluation, feedback with our stakeholders, with our teachers, with young children, with parents, again and again and again as you try to advance, advance towards something you think is actually going to move the needle. So here's the concept. Here's the concept. We've come up with kind of a different framing again because we're talking about a different kind of learner, a different kind of context. So it's an AI-powered, we call it a learning companion. We don't call it a tutor, we call it a learning companion. Um, and it is envisioned to be actually a playful practice partner. So not a teacher, not a tutor, but a practice partner that can play fun educational games with young children. Um, and we've been focusing on early literacy and language skills. And so there's a big reason why we think that is a big critical area uh, of intervention. So it supplements, it doesn't compete with teachers. And that makes teachers feel more comfortable with this, this, this sort of technology in the classroom. We actually model peer-like interactions. We're not trying to model the teacher-adult interactions. We're actually looking at peer-to-peer -peer learning. It's a very powerful form of learning um, that includes, is inclusive. It welcomes the participation of parents, peers, and teachers in that process. The social embodiment of the robot actually helps support this in-person interaction. It adaptively personalizes, as I've mentioned, um, content behavior interaction style through interactions. 
um, to really augment and enrich social and emotional learning, which is you know how young children they learn through play with, with with social others. So and not just with the robot, with people as well. So again, this this photo is actually very important because it shows how the robot is including interactions of the other in-person people around around the robot. This is a really important part of the of the uh, experience we want to be able to to capture, and we wanted to work both in school and at home because we know that, again, there's a critical role that parents play in the early childhood education of, of their children. So how can we help enrich and make that better? So I want to just show you a video of what this looks like in practice. And it's probably a very different kind of interaction than what you might imagine of children having with an AI or a robot. The robot is actually playing an educational game with this little girl. The game is on the tablet computer. It's inspired by the game of I Spy. So imagine like, you know, we call it word quest, but there's a challenge word in the video. The challenge word is lavender. And the child and the robot can do all the same actions on the tablet. They play the game together. They take turns. And they pan through these virtual scenes trying to find objects that match this challenge word of lavender. So the child and the robot could be finding objects that might be purple, for instance, if the child knows that's what lavender means. So that's the context. I'm just gonna let the interaction play out. And I want you just to kind of appreciate all the social and emotional dimensions of, of this interaction. I'm trying to find lavender color stuff. The word was lavender. Yes. And what is lavender? What? Girl. Jumping. So that's just not right. I'm sure you will do better next time. Encouragement. I believe in you. She's a little disappointed, but I believe in you. Robot's turn. Now look at that gesture. Right? She is right back in that interaction. The touch, right? It's actually the robot's turn, but she is fully engaged in this interaction. Robot makes a choice. And she says back to the robot, I believe in you. Right, so, so many dimensions to this interaction. All right, so some highlights. We do a lot of randomized controlled trials out the wazoo. Okay, we compare to baseline, we prefer kind of a fixed curriculum, personalized robot, you name it. So uh, the punchline is we see improved learning outcomes, things like vocabulary, story retail, et cetera, et cetera. We see greater social emotional engagement, facial expressions, body pose, galvanic skin response, and the personalized robot. You saw an example there of social emulation, which is fascinating. So children learn all kinds of things from their friends, right? We know that. So we found that if a robot demonstrates a growth mindset when it makes a mistake, oh, that's okay, that's how I learn. Lo and behold, children start to emulate a growth mindset and start to persist in harder challenge problems. So this is actually very kind of, it's, it's, it's the social psychology of engagement that's really Fascinating. We have also measured the relational closeness that children report feeling with the robot, finding that the closer that relationship correlates with higher learning outcomes. Interesting, we know that the better relationship a child has with their teacher could result in higher learning outcomes. And we see that relationship is even stronger when we add personalization. So we're seeing all these interesting interactions happening between these different kinds of, of algorithmic interactions in these contexts. So that's in a school context. I just want to also acknowledge you've been doing more. Can it maybe go back here? We're doing more work also more recently in, in home context. Again, parents play a critical role in enriching the language of the home environment, which plays a critical role in uh, early literacy skills. There's been a lot of concern by the media and others that if you introduce something like an agent, like a robot in a home environment, somehow that's going to damage or harm our in-person social relationships with other people. So we've been doing a lot of work showing that when you design the robot the right way, you can actually enhance and enrich those interactions. So in this context, parents are doing storytelling time with their children, and the robot acts as a social catalyst. Kind of helps to moderate that kind of interaction to make it more, more rich between the parent and the child. We've done, again, studies showing that the amount of times that parents spend in conversation with their children around stories has increased. The ratio of time parents spend actually engaging in the conversation, they spend more speaking time, which is really important. And, um, you know, we've also found that 
Families where the parent themselves may be an English language learner actually benefit even more from the adaptive condition. So when we talk about equity and support, we're seeing some, again, these are all very kind of intriguing uh, opportunities. So what's next? I mean, we're talking a lot about generative AI. So obviously, generative AI is gonna enable a more flexible, a more child-driven interaction around, say, dialogic storytelling. We want that to be pedagogically sound. Hal, uh, Sal has made that point. But can we make it, again, more open-ended for the child? Can we make it more playful? Can we make it more engaging? So anyway, here's a punchline. We have this Jibo, we call it the robot Jibo. We have the station that has these digitized storybooks that are interactive. The story is kind of narrated by, by the tablet station. And then the robot can engage children in Again, Q&A questions, exploration around the story. So there's two, two stories here uh, that kind of show two different aspects of interaction. And this is kind of very prototyping in our lab, but it gives you a sense of, of what we're going for. So this is one of the uh, storybooks in the curriculum that we work with in our schools in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm not sure. I think I remember something with beads. Can you tell me the rest? You're right about the beats. They are part of the doll's decoration. So giving hints. But let's focus on what the whole doll is made from. Critical it's thinking. The type of soft material that comes from an animal. Can you guess which one? There's a vocabulary word here. It said buckskin, but what animal does that come from? And then buckskin answering the question. The deer, which is a kind of animal. So again, a prototype here, but more child-driven, tied to the narrative content That's of this particular story. Can you tell me what he built his house out Something of? a little more playful. Mm -hmm. I think it's made out of cakes. That sounds delicious. Unfortunately, I don't think that's right. The first pig built his house out of straw. What would you use to build your house? That's an interesting question. I think I'd build my house out of solar panels so that I can power my home with renewable energy. Wow, that's very smart. Thank you. <laughs> so we can see the potential, we can see the opportunity, and again, for us, it's how can you allow children's curiosity to drive more of the dialogue happening around these storybooks. That's what we're hoping we can get out of these large, large language models. Okay, so here we are. We're a robotics lab. We're designing robots for all kinds of applications. This is just as one of them. And we are realizing you know, these AI technologies, we're talking about learning, right? We're talking about shaping growth mindset. We are recognizing that AI can shape people's beliefs, their attitudes, all these kinds of things. We're trying to do it to benefit people, but of course, as we've been learning through other technologies, not necessarily the case. And we decided, holy moly, people need to understand AI because there's all kinds of crazy dialogue happening in the media. It's like they need to be AI literate. People need to understand this stuff. And so we started to spend on, uh, uh, more of our research program around what we're going to call AI literacy. So this is work done under the, the, the RAISE banner. Again, RAISE is a new initiative. It's just two years old. It stands for Responsible AI for Social Empowerment and Education. We've done a lot of work around K-12. So what is AI literacy? First, the big point I wanna make is AI literacy is for everyone because it's affecting all of our lives, our professional lives, our personal lives. Kids are using and touching AI every day and not necessarily even realizing it. So part of it is at a great appropriate way, demystifying AI, how does AI actually work? It's not a sentient ether, it's a technology, it can be trained and adapted in certain ways, but how do you, how do you demystify how it works and how do you teach kids how you design it responsibly? How can you train the systems to not exhibit bias, right? So how do you do that? How do you relate it to its responsible use in digital citizenship so children can grow up having an informed voice of how they want AI to be used in society, its responsible use uh, on applications? How do you recognize when AI is in an application? And then also, because AI is a transformative technology in all kinds of domains and disciplines, how do we help children feel this sense of agency and empowerment that they can shape the future 
with AI for themselves and for their communities. We want to achieve all of these things around AI literacy. So what do we do? Well, we're MIT. We love to build tools that empower people to learn through making. This is like just part of our DNA. And so we've been taking platforms like uh, the Scratch Programming Language, like MIT App Inventor, which allows kids to make working Android apps with state-of-the-art AI blocks that we've been putting into the system. So they learn about how these technologies work. They design these technologies to try to improve their situation for that of community as a very empowered sense. We're talking a lot about generative AI, so I just want to give a shout out that we do actually do a lot of curriculum and exercises specifically to have kids work with generative AI technology themselves as a tool of self-expression and its responsible use as well, from elementary all the way through high school. We have launched a program called Day of AI. It's inspired by Hour of Code. We figure AI is bigger and broader, so it should be a day of AI. Again, AI is for everyone. So this is for all students, for all teachers, K-12. Any subject matter teacher can teach the day of AI. We've designed, again, these engaging curriculum, hands-on learning exercises, critical thinking, you name it. It's for in-classroom learning, in-classroom learning. Introduces AI literacy as I've described it, short format, and I think this is part of our, our kind of uh, uh, crack the code, so to speak, is that it is not such a heavy lift for a teacher to say, what is this AI? I hear about it all the time, I'm curious about it. This is something that's not too much of a, again, a heavy lift for me to bring it to my students to try it out and see if I want more. So these curriculum are multidisciplinary, they're hands-on, they're student relatable, um, they encourage critical thinking, creativity, all these kinds of ways that we love to do at, at, at MIT, how we teach our students as well. Free, completely free, the curriculum's free, our professional development teacher's free. Um, and we think a lot about equitable access. So regardless of how tech comfortable or tech resourced you are, we have a wide range of activities. It's a very modular curriculum that you can be a very low tech resource community or very high tech resource community. There's something for the teacher and their students um, that will be of value. Just a quick slide of like, we have been creating a whole bunch of curriculum on a range of topics that we think are really important for kids to learn. When we first launched this program in 2022, we did a, Can Machines Be Creative? We did generative AI on image generation and social media and deep fakes. In 2023, we saw all the chatter about ChatGPT. We released a ChatGPT curriculum, most downloaded curriculum last, or I guess still this year, this May. So constantly expanding the curriculum global interest in a way that we just did not expect. So over 10,000 teachers from over 114 countries have registered and downloaded the Day of AI curriculum. We have a collaborator in Latin America and Chile who just uh, uh, translated the curriculum into Spanish. We got another 3,000 educators in South America in like three months. In the United States, it's our largest uh, group of teachers, over 3,400 teachers, 31% from Title I schools. We do a lot of outreach to Title I schools as well. Um, just some highlights. You know, one of the things we get from teachers is they feel they've learned a lot about AI through this, through this curriculum. We do a lot of attention to the professional development, so that's really exciting to see. And teachers report students feeling much greater sense of agency and optimism once they've had this curriculum as well. So again, how we foster and cultivate the sense of children can grow up to shape the future with these technologies is, is one of our goals and we're starting to get a good signal with that as well. So again, just some highlights. When we released the ChatGPT curriculum, so the New York uh, City Public School District was kind of famous for being the first one to ban ChatGPT in schools. This is a blog from Chancellor Banks basically saying now because of these materials at MIT, we reversed our policy and now we're gonna approach this from one of responsible AI. So we're starting to engage them and train their teachers in this curriculum right now. <laughs> so a lot of ideas, a lot of food for thought, a lot of other dimensions, I think, of the gender of AI education dimension. I just want to end uh, with some kind of uh, reflections and some takeaways. You know, the first is when you talk about AI and design, I mean, co-design for, 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 for equitable communities is, is really, really important. You want to do it in context. You want to iterate, super, super important. You know, just appreciating, especially for, for equitable education, there's development of knowledge and skills, but also very important is mindsets and attitudes and confidence and agency. Can you design these technologies and tools and integrate them in a way that builds a whole holistic uh, uh, educational experience for children? Um, we're a big believer in making it really emotionally engaging, meaningful experiences that are socially situated. 
not to exclude people or push them away, but to bring them together. We were big, big believers of that. We got to empower and prepare teachers to be able to deliver this and have confidence. Uh, we want to cultivate responsible student agency with these hands-on, meaningful, creative learning experiences. And we want to empower children, right, to have this positive impact in their community. The reality is these tools are getting to the point where kids can make actual stuff that other people can use. That's the reality that we're in now. We might as well start trying to help cultivate that sense of responsible design, how do you make a better, things better for everyone uh, attitude, and give them the experience of doing that uh, in a very tangible way. So thank you. Okay, we are. We're gonna transition now. Hopefully you enjoyed those two wonderful presentations. Um, I have to pause for just a moment. My name is Bridget Terry Long. I'm very proud to be the Dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. It's a... And I have to say it is absolutely amazing to see so many people here for this event uh, as the Axum Collaborative works to advance our mission to expand access to education and deepen the impact for millions of learners. It's been my pleasure to serve on the Axum Collaborative Board of Trustees and to contribute my expertise as a scholar in education and also bringing forth um, the many, many resources uh, and expertise of my colleagues. You know, when HGSC, when we first realized how serious ChatGPT was going to be, I think like many of our colleagues in many schools and universities, we were, you know, immediately thinking about the questions of, well, what's the appropriate use of AI in academic work and how should we adapt our assignments and assessments and pedagogy? Um, but longer term, there are much more important questions that we've started to think about as a faculty you know, what are the essential elements of the learning process and how might AI complement or bolster learning? How might we design uses that play to the strengths of human learning, creativity, judgment, as well as the strengths that generative AI systems give us? And what are the implications of all the changes that are being brought about? So I'm gonna welcome our two panelists to get started with a number of questions. Uh, as they come and get settled. <laughs> I think what's motivating so many of us is we want to ensure that this, these wonderful opportunities that are created by AI are realized to the benefit of all learners. And the future has not been written. As we've seen in the past, new technologies often exacerbate inequalities, and those with greater resources are better able to capitalize on new innovations. So, so how do we maximize the benefits of generative AI for the lead learners who need it most? And how do we manage the costs, uh, not only financial costs, but also costs of improper use, of displacement? And there's also lots of questions about adoption. I'm giving you guys a little bit of a preview of where I'm gonna go. Now, we just went through a pandemic that forced schools and universities to flip their teaching to remote delivery. Some embraced this rethinking of teaching and learning while others did not. Leadership, resources, expertise, and context mattered greatly in terms of what learners experienced. It was not a one size fits all. And the same is likely to be true for AI tools. I've already taken a peek and please keep your questions go coming. Well, what's it gonna be like for different kind of learners? What's it gonna be like for neurodivergent learners? What's it gonna be like for students in developing countries who don't have the same kind of resources, certainly not of Harvard, but in many schools in the United States? So that's what we're gonna try to tackle. Keep your questions coming. I have a nice little iPad here uh, that's gonna give me your questions as they come in. Um, but to start, so, let's, let's continue the conversation. What surprised you the most over the last nine months as you started uh, this journey of sharing this with students and teachers and schools? Oh, yeah, you know, when, when um, we first had access to the technology about a year ago, you could imagine the debates we started to have inside of our organization about, and 
there weren't many people to have it because it was kind of us and open AI at the time. Half of us were like, this changes everything, let's get in there. And then the other, not always the other half, there was sometimes both uh, from some people was like, wait, this thing has, can make errors. How do we make sure about bias, uh, student safety? Um, you know, we have a, a brand that we want to protect. What if it looks like we're just, you know, jumping in on something uh, too early? So people were, were super worried about all of these narratives and, and some legit and some were more the narrative around it. Um, one, we made the decision to like, look, let's turn all those fears into features and, and, and design for them as opposed to running away from them. Um, but it, it was an open, especially when the chat GPT stuff came out, we're like, oh, this is getting negative and we're going to come out there pretty early with something. Um, but what was surprising is when we came out, maybe because of chat GPT, we didn't get a lot of philosophical pushback. Actually, less than I would have. Like, yeah. like, like we are. Some, in many cases, we're like, you should ask us about our safety. You should ask. And not that they're not care, but they don't know what to ask yet. And so, like, and, and now there's a lot of people rushing into it. And we are telling people, make sure if a child is using it, what happens if the conversation goes into an just unconstructive place? You know, we have a second AI that's moderating it. Like. How do you have transparency for a student? How do you make sure it's pedagogically sound? How do you prevent cheating? But I've, I've been pleasantly surprised by that. Um, pleasantly surprised by some of the things that we didn't expect. Um, you, you know, the first time I saw it used in like a, a, a classroom of second and third graders, I'm like, and, and I saw the kids kind of fumble a little bit. And I was like, oh, this, isn't, this kind of isn't working. Um, but then the teacher later told me how good it was because these kids have trouble articulating their questions. They don't know how to, and this is giving them practice with that. And I was like, wow, I don't even remember that that was a thing. Uh, so overall, uh, it's, 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 it's been positive. And you know, every, honestly, every hour you start thinking about the potential, you realize we've been thinking too narrow about it. Uh, you know, that, that, um, that one activity where you can talk to historical characters or fictional characters, that came from when I, last Christmas I was, just, we were prototyping stuff. I had my 12 year, at the time, 11 year old daughter. And, and I, I wanted to see like, what if she writes a story with the AI, not by the AI. And she was writing a story about a social media influencer who got stuck on a desert island without an internet connection, which is a good, I think, plot for her show. <laughs> and the character, Samantha, was having like an anxiety attack because it was so beautiful, but she couldn't share it with anyone. <laughs> and my 11-year-old daughter, and this is her and the AI, so already that's kind of science fiction. And then my 11-year-old daughter's like, I kind of want to console Samantha. I want to, I was like, do it. And so she's like, I want to talk to Samantha. And then Samantha's like, Dia, I don't know what to do. It's so beautiful. I need to share this. And, 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 and my daughter, 11 year old says, Samantha, it's okay. You really have to live in the moment. You don't have to share. Like, and, and to see my daughter, and I didn't even know that was in my daughter, like all this like meditative mindfulness type of language. Uh, but that, that's when I felt like this is like the holodeck. For my, my daughter is talking to a character that she co-invented with an AI and practicing mindfulness with it. Um, but that was also surprising, and then we've, we've continued to see that kind of thing in classrooms. Okay, that's, that's fantastic. But let's, I mean, let's push on that a little mm -hmm. bit more. What's been the reaction of teachers and students? Because I, I can imagine you are a wonderful father. But take, for example, my husband, who saw Snapchat <laughs> and said, I want nothing to do with Snapchat. I want nothing to do with ChatGPT. I mean, it does rely on the adults and students' lives, whether it's teachers or parents, to be, become partners. And so how do you think through, um, yes, they're gonna be early adopters, but how do you think about you know, folks who are a little bit more reticent or worried yeah, and there's a funny misinterpretation of that last clause. I, I think so. <laughs> but you have a wonderful husband, a very good father. Absolutely wonderful husband who hates Snapchat yes. and refuses to use it. I, I don't or like learn Snapchat. it or I, anything. I, I don't. I still like I, my brain does yeah. not process yeah. Snapchat. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think what's different about this technology versus almost every other technology. In some, in some ways, it's mind-blowingly advanced. Many of us who've been in the field for a day, we're like, wow, this is happening now. But in another way, it's almost, I think, almost more natural for a lot of folks. It's kind of what science fiction has been promising them for decades. So on one level, like, you know, a disappearing text messages or images, that makes no sense to me. But being able to chat with something that feels quasi-human or even human on some levels, I think people get it. And then I think, 
chat GPT being so imperfect and going out there and then people having to process. And then as you start bringing better and better things, people are more open to it. And I think the thing that I'm most excited about is every other ed tech tool, including Khan Academy before this, especially educators, we would, we would tell them like, look, we have efficacy studies. If you get your students using this for X minutes a week, um, and you just have to do it this way and here are the dashboards and the teachers they are all like, oh, that's great, but it's just one more thing for them to do. And they're already overworked. They have a million things to do. What we're excited about is we think, I mean, there is a learning curve, uh, but it can, if it can dramatically save them time on lesson planning, writing progress reports, communicating, and it's supporting their students in ways that feel very natural, like we're realizing the, the world of dashboards is we think dead. Like you know, every ed tech tool, every tool before you want to monitor it, you have a dashboard that looks like a spreadsheet and you kind of have to be a data analyst to kind of, but now you can talk to Conmigo and say, which student should I you know, be concerned about? And Conmigo says, so these are the three and here's why. It's like having a data analyst next to you, which is a much more natural thing for a human, a teacher to do. So um, I, I, I'm optimistic that it, it's a much more natural type, of, especially once you bring voice in and it can see, it's going to be more natural. Okay. Okay, Cynthia, I'd love to bring you into this. Your projects are very much focused on empowering <coughs> users and co-constructing products and tools. You know, what advice would you have for many who are building tools or even for, for us all? Yeah, so I would definitely, just to, to, to elaborate a bit on what you asked about parents, so we're finding as we talk to school districts about AI literacy, they're saying, what do you have for parents? To your point, parents don't know what AI is, they're, you know, especially when you're talking about more uh, at-risk communities, they don't trust it. So, so how to bring parents into the conversation is also very important. I think in terms of your question about how do we empower young people. You know, again, we're living in this, building what Saul was saying, this, this very provocative time where these tools are becoming so easy to use. And again, things like MIT App Inventor, it's block-based coding, it's, you know, lowers the barrier for writing code. Um, young children can now build things with AI, and then with generative AI, explorations of, well, now can you code directly on the phone by just talking to it, right? And what would that do when you talk about parts of the world where the, 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 the smartphone is the device that people have? Lowering that barrier so that many more people can create working apps to help them learn, to engage, to do their work. I mean, that's mind-blowing as well. So I think the... The, 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 the process and the deep insights we always have, you need to embrace and co-design and engage who you're trying to serve with this technology. You need to understand the cultural context, you need to know the, you just, you need to understand what it is you're trying to come into so that you're designing something that makes sense, that you have to be able to monitor and check and measure. I mean, we're seeing examples of, you know, when AI goes off the rails, you know. So, so there's new kinds of practices for responsible design that we just have to be much more mindful of. But we have seen, I mean, it just blows me away what children are able to make with these tools and technologies. You know, we, we've run um, uh, six-week workshops and teach them how to basically do their own deep learning models. and. You know, young people are coming up with like ways of analyzing facial asymmetries for early detection of stroke because one of the, the, the student's fathers had a stroke and, and got to the hospital too late. So deep, meaningful applications that they're coming up with with tools that they can actually start to build really impressive things. It's, it's really inspiring. Absolutely. So lots and lots of possibilities. One of the questions though that we received was about the ethics and you talked a bit about the ethical use and how do we train, support, educate. Uh, and, and Sal, I wanna bring you into this as well, particularly when the future is unknown. How do we prepare for uses that we haven't even thought of yet? Uh, yeah, I mean, my view, obviously there's some obvious guardrails and protections that when they're obvious, you should take the trouble to, to put those in. I, I, w w one thing that I, you know, I think anytime there's a new technology, people will, 
sometimes say, oh, it's not perfect, we can't use it, or it introduces some bias, we can't use it. Um, I always push back a little bit, and, I, and I'm saying, well, you shouldn't be measuring it versus perfection. Sure. Uh, you should measure it versus the status quo. And what does the status quo look like? Um, you know, for, for example, obviously there's a lot of sensitivity around one day using AI to say screen resumes or college applications, right? right. I mean, that's a sensitive place where bias can, but, um, and you know, we're not doing this, but I can imagine at some point, um, one, even though I know people say these models are black boxes, but you can, you can stress test them much better than you can, say, a hiring manager or an admissions officer. You can give them thousands of resumes that have been, you just change the names or just change it so that it, it's a different gender, it's a different ethnicity, different, to see is it, um, is it and I would say the standard should be less bi significantly less biased mm. than, than, than the status quo. Um, uh, ideally, no bias at all. Um, and, and so you can, you can stress test it in a way Ways that you can't do traditional, traditional um, tools. I think the other dimension a lot of people talk about is you know the, the inequity of sometimes. You know, I, if you go to a, a lot of I'm sure a lot of folks here. If you go to a lot of neighborhoods in Silicon Valley, people have been using some form of generative AI for now two three years. You know, is that introducing um, inequity? And and there I always give the example of it. Well, if, if if that continues, it will. Um, but. It, instead of looking at the proportion who are using it at any given moment, to think about what happens when you remove it. So I remember a few years ago, we're, we, were, we were the official practice for the SAT. Mm -hmm. And Paul Tuff, who I'm a big fan of, but he wrote a book about that. And he looked at the data, and it turns out that the proportion of people who are using this Khan Academy tool, which was free, the college board was paying us to do it. Um, and so the whole goal was equity. Like, let's make it so that you don't have to pay thousands of dollars to get test prep. Uh, and it was the most efficacious one. We said, look, if you look at that proportion of people using it, it was pretty representative of who took the SAT, but it was a slightly higher proportion of educated families, wealthier families. And so his conclusion was, oh, maybe this is making the, 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 the problem exactly. worse. Mm -hmm. And I remember I got on the phone with him, I'm like, Paul, you're looking at this completely wrong. You shouldn't look at it as a proportion. You have to think about what happens if you remove the tool. If you remove the tool, those educated, affluent families are just going to take out $1,000 or $5,000 and go find prep for their kids. But all those other kids who are using our tool are not going to have anything. Mm -hmm. And so you have to compare the reality with it versus without it. You have to compare what it could be versus not perfection, but compared to the status quo. Okay. Um, let's go a bit, deep, a bit deeper in thinking about different kinds of communities um, we might serve. Mm -hmm. um, Cynthia, I know you have a project uh, where you're creating an AI tutor mm -hmm. uh, in computer science and at three very different institutions, including a community college. Yeah. Could you talk a bit about that project and how it varies, how the, the project is varying by site? Yeah, so I mean, very early stages, but, but to your point, Bridget, you know, we have certainly seen many examples of when you introduce a new technology to education, can actually worsen the divide rather rather than close it. So when we were writing this proposal with the idea of a gen generative AI, I'll call it a learning companion, because we're still designing what the experience really needs to be for students, but we hear about all these incredible career opportunities in computing and AI, and, and, and yet, you know, it's not, it's not an equitable pathway to get there. So we uh, have a, a new grant working with Georgia State University, who is, you know, one of the top universities around equity and technology uh, in the country, um, with faculty who teach their intro to computing course, and community colleges, because if we look at, again, underrepresented uh, people in STEM, many of them are, are coming up through community college education. The dropout rate of community college is like 60%. You know, I mean, it's like, oh my God. So anyway, we are engaging them in co-design from day one, really trying to understand their educational context for them as lecturers, how this tool would be useful to them, what are the challenges and opportunities for their particular students. Many of them have to work, so they go to school during the day, they work in the afternoon, they come home 10 p.m. at night, they can't get any help, they're trying to do their homework, you know, so, so how can you help give them the support and the access that they need just in time when they do need it? But then how do you also create a learning community? Because the other thing that we're learning from uh, speaking with them is the, the, the sense of 
belonging. So it's not just the skills, right, and the knowledge. It's a sense of belonging that if you don't feel you belong in a field like computing or computer science, you won't even try to access the supports because you don't feel like you're entitled to it, right? So, so there are so many different layers. And again, the reason why I wanted to show the work that we're doing with you know, the early childhood robots is to show that you actually can design these technologies in a way that can help foster senses of belonging and attitudes, but also cultivating that social human community of learners. And all of these things, I think, are actually important. So again, early stages, but we're trying to look at it, again, very holistically comparing the differences between these organizations, as well as, you know, MIT, you know, people have never coded before coming in and taking intro to computing. So we have a lot of data. We're trying to leverage, GSU has a lot of their data for their kinds of learners. We want to capture more data representative of different kinds of learners. We want to iterate, we want to evaluate, we want to test, and then we want to expand and engage more collaborators in this, in this network. So early days, but we're trying to do it carefully. Yes. Yeah, and responsibly. And in partnership. And in partnership. So I'm curious, how many of you are computer science concentrators or have a computer science background? Shouldn't you raise your hand? Shouldn't you guys raise your hand? <laughs> okay. So not to scare you, but as you showed us out, Generative AI is very good at basic coding. Does that mean that we don't need computer scientists anymore? How is, mm -hmm. how is AI changing the labor market and yeah. what we should be teaching our students? Yeah, I, you know, it's hard to know, 100% uh, sure. I, 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 I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, just, I just raised my hand. I had a, 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 a my original uh, career was in tech as software engineering. And I remember, um, well, I remember in the late 90s when I graduated, that was the be beginning of tech outsourcing and globalization, and the narrative was, your job's gonna go to India. It's gonna get outsourced there. It's, it's a very similar narrative, right? And it's gonna go to some, there's a bunch of people in India who are happy to code that for one third of the, of the salary. And that was some of my motivation for going to business school. I was like, okay, I have to. Um, but the, re the, the reality was, um, <laughs> That, that globalization happened, but at the same time, uh, coders in Silicon Valley today, even adjusting for inflation, probably make three times what I was making um, in the late 90s, adjusted for inflation. Uh, so something happened there where, um, because uh, there was so much opportunity for creation because of, frankly, the internet, and then eventually probably mobile devices, that yes, some of the work went someplace else. But then to some degree, the higher level work became even more valuable. Yeah. And, and so I think you're gonna see the similar thing with, with AI. In fact, I think it's going to happen faster. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think, and, and, I, and I think the other principle is, um, technology is always about extending, amplifying human intent. And so now when you code, you, you don't have to do a lot of the work of the junior programmer, you can immediately level up to the architect. Instead of being, you can move up to the editor-in-chief instead of being the staff writer. But who wants an editor-in-chief or, or, or an architect who can't at least manage or, or code as well or write as well as their, their new AI subordinates? Um, so I think the, the, the folks who are able to at least hang with the AI are going to be very, very empowered. Uh, so, and that's in all fields. Now, I think if you are in some of these fields and you were doing you know, basic data integration, you were doing basic porting from one language to another, and that's all you could do, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. AI's gonna, if, you're, if you're the person who writes that article on CNBC every day that's like, why did the stock market go up, and you're just, AI, that's probably already AI. Um, <laughs> you're in trouble. Uh, but as, as, if you can manage it to do higher order things, I think you're, I'll give one last example. Obviously, we all know about the Screenwriter Guild yep. You yep. Know, debate about AI. And I'm like, these folks have it all wrong. Like right now you have these amazing screenplay writers. They write these amazing stories, which are really the backbone of a movie. Yep. And they get a small cut of it. And then these producers and these, all these other people show up, these actors and, you know, and then they get the bulk of it because it costs a lot of money and you need, you know, you got to get, you know, Tom Cruise and whatever else. You got to pay them tens of millions of dollars. But in the next five years, you, the screenplay, are going to be in a position where you can produce the whole movie for maybe a budget of $10,000 as opposed to $100 million. So they should be embracing it because they're actually the core of the story there. Uh, while if you can't write a good story, if you, don't, if you can't recognize what a good story is like, mm -hmm. who cares how much extra money you throw at, as we all know, there's, there's plenty. So, so I think it's all about hanging with it and then using it to, to amplify you, you'll be in good shape. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll reinforce that. So as part of the, the project, we have an advisor group of industry folks that we've been interviewing around what's the future of computing, how do you future-proof skills. It's exactly what Sal was saying. So. They need to embrace, so the, the, the practices, the skills may change with these technologies, but being able to embrace these tools to elevate your game, to think at that more creative systems level, I mean, that is that is where people you know need to continue to be because we kind of know the intent, we know we have our values, like that that should always be where humans are adding our, our perspective, our wisdom, our, 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 our values to. Okay, so building on that and thinking just generally, then what's your advice for teachers and educators, and I know I have a lot of colleagues in the audience, because we have, in many respects, we're moving the goalposts mm. as we're learning to, to teach people more. So what's your advice for the educators in the room at all levels? Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely have a whole set of advice pre-generative AI, so I'll say a little bit. You know, I, I used to say this 10 years ago. Um, there, there's no reason to give the standard sage on a stage talk anymore and and already you should make classrooms interactive etc cetera, etc cetera, generally assume we've done that we've done that okay um, yeah, I would say embrace it. I would say jump in, you know, uh, ask, I'm asking everyone at the Khan Academy team, even if immediately it might reduce your productivity a little bit to, to, to learn new tools, it's gonna move you forward. So if you're a teacher, if you're a, a, an instructional coach, lean into these tools. Obviously there's like the raw tools like like chat GPT, but obviously things like Conmigo are there. Dive in with both feet, start to use it, start to play with it, give folks like us feedback on how to make it better because we're very receptive to that. Um, and, and I think as long as you do that, yeah, it's gonna be in good shape. You're gonna, yeah, and then you're gonna discover more and more uses for it. And there's, you know, there are increasing materials um, being made available now around, again, AI literacy for educators, for teachers. So help is on the way, but I have to tell you, teachers are amazing creative designers of these things as well. We learn a lot from how teachers are adapting and using these tools in their classrooms. So it should really be a dialogue. I mean, we're, we at MIT are creating these curricula and so forth, but we do a lot of work with, with educators um, and they give us tremendous insights in terms of how they're using it, where the opportunities are, where their concerns are. But there are increasingly more and more materials to help you wrap your head around, like what is AI, how do you responsibly use it, what's the tool du jour, <laughs> you know, how, does it, how should it inform your, your teaching practice and where are the opportunities? Like, for instance, you know, we love project-based learning, but project-based learning is really hard to bring into a classroom because it can be very intensive in trying to understand how do you assess project-based learning. Maybe this is another opportunity for generative AI to help you know, still have the teacher have the 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 the, the high order assessment, but but to help make it faster and easier um, to be able to engage and, and assess through more sophisticated projects as students. We find that in our work, when students engage in this creative capacity, they're really engaged. They think deeply. They ask questions. So more of that, more multidisciplinary thinking, more of that would be great. So if AI, generative AI can help make that more tenable in the classroom to bring that into practice, I think everyone's gonna benefit from that. So innovation, I think. Mm -hmm. Teachers should be part of the innovation movement. But I think you're also underscoring, you know, the important role that community colleges are gonna have. I'm, since you're thinking about the labor market, this is a conversation where we need to think well, what are employers looking for? How is that going to change? And maybe some of you undergraduates are wondering about that as you think about graduation. Yeah. But also the retooling, because there are gonna be some people who are going to have to learn new things. And so where are they gonna find those skills? Community colleges. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but going back to the central question, lots of possibility here, really enjoyed both of your presentations, lots of examples. But what are the things that we absolutely have to prioritize to make sure that this, these new tools, these new possibilities are a great equalizer? And that for all students, special education, neurodivergent, many different cultures, many different learning styles and incomes. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's 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 the name of the game. We we all just have to be out. As I said, there's some obvious things you have to do. I've talked about a lot of them about basic guardrails, safety mechanisms, especially if you're talking about under 18 users. You know, in the software world, there's something called Red Hat testing, where you get good people trying to get the AI to do bad things. Or um, there's a lot of that that we're doing. And, and you know, to credit, I know there's sometimes a lot of criticism of the people who are making the models themselves. But I, you know, we've seen behind the scenes what's happening at OpenAI, what's happening at Google, at Anthropic. What, what I'm to some degree heartened by is, uh, you know, like I started a nonprofit because I didn't think market forces tend, tend to work in, in education. And, and I think market forces have traditionally done pretty, in the social media world, they've done negative things because um, the, 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 the companies have been able to say, oh, it's not my content. And then they create their own AIs that say, but feed people whatever they need to maximize viewership and ad viewing. And unfortunately, those AIs have discovered that, you know, triggering content, stuff that makes you depressed, et cetera. What's different about the, gener the large language models now is there's no plausible deniability that this this is your model. Mm -hmm. Like OpenAI, this is your model. Microsoft, Google, this is your model. And they know if, they know that the whole world is Red Hat testing it. Mm -hmm. They know the whole world is just looking to do a gotcha and then put it on social media. And even one of those cases where it shows bias is going to be, you know, their name on the, on the front of the New York Times. So the good thing is I think the market forces, the, for, for the preservation of their own brand, they're doing, frankly, a lot of good, I think, and I know a lot of these people, they, they care too, but even the market forces are reinforcing it. So uh, that, that heartens uh, me. But what, what I would tell people is just make sure there's the right guardrails, make sure it's pedagogically, pedagogically sound, um, make sure that you're being very careful, especially if you're talking about student data, anyone's data, what's being used to train, what's not being used, how is it being used. Um, and you know, the, the, there, there's, a, there's a million startups now in, in generative AI and education and beyond. And that's, I, I always tell our team, like, look, we're a nonprofit. We can be competitive. We can say, oh, we want to win and all that. But it's, that's not why we're really in the game. We're in the game because we're like, okay, we think that the world needs to be better because we're here. If someone else is going to solve the problem without us, like we should go do something else. And, and, and the reason why we, we believe we have a role here is, yeah, not every, a lot of other people are going to try to, not, not only think the people who are making the models because they have a lot to lose from their brand, but a lot of these startups are going to try to make things that look nice but when you dig in a little bit, it's going to be full of hallucinations, full of bias, full of things, and they don't have a lot to lose mm -hmm. in that situation. So I think that's kind of our role, is to hopefully lead by showing things that can be done responsibly, but still very innovatively. And just building from that, the lessons of you've been around for a while, how will you reach those populations who need you the most? Yeah, you know, like this was our mission statement is free world class education for anyone anywhere, uh, which when I wrote it as one guy in a walk in closet felt a little bit delusional. Um, and, and over the it's become less delusional and we're in 50 plus languages and all of that. But I mean, a couple of cool things have happened. Um, internet adoption, device adoption, the one silver lining of the pandemic, it accelerated that probably by five, 10 years. You have things like Starlink, it's bringing down the cost. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, even things like localization. I mean, you, you, that young girl I showed, it, 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 it's spoken, um, it speaks in every language. It can even speak in like colloquial Klingon. It can literally, um, uh, you know, and even, yeah, I mean, my, my daughter likes to speak it to Conmigo in Gen Z, um, Gen Z English, you know, so, um, <laughs> but, and, and it helps her to the engagement point of view. I thought it was like, why are you doing that? But she actually spends more, t it engages her. Um, so, so I think the, the localization is going to happen faster. You're going to be able to get it out to more people faster. There are some real costs with, um, um, with, uh, with generative AI, but those costs are coming down dramatically. Um, for, I mean, we have had to, you know, we're talking about free education, but we've had to charge for Conmigo because it's so expensive. Otherwise, we'd go bankrupt. But we're going to announce officially tomorrow that we're about to dramatically, because we've been able to get a lot of efficiencies. And I know, I think it's going to come down by another order of magnitude within the next uh, two, three years. And then there's the interesting things we're discussing where we have these dedicated instances, we have to manage them so that they can handle peak capacity during school hours in the US. Mm -hmm. But guess what? No one's using them in the middle of the night, which is school hours in India. Mm -hmm. So we're realizing, oh wow, maybe we could use that same capacity and do it at a much lower cost uh, in places like India. And the localization problem almost solves itself. So we're already working with you know, major states in places like Brazil and India and, other, and Philippines now. Um, we're, 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 yeah, we think it's it's probably in five years you're going to see 
probably tens, I, I don't think this is a grandiose state, tens of millions of kids, even in villages in India, who are going to take out their cell phone and, and really feel like they have, you know, I always say Alexander the Great had Aristotle as his personal tutor. Like, what if we could scale that? And I, I think it's, it's going to happen in the next five, 10 years. Okay. And Cynthia. Yeah. Last so, words. Yeah. How do we make sure this is a great equalizer? Yeah. So I do feel there needs to be intentional engagement of these communities. I think, you know, the, the, those who are more inclined to lean in are going to be the ones who do. It's those who aren't necessarily inclined because they don't trust it or whatever. You know, I think there de needs to be more deliberate engagement of those communities, I think, to really understand, again, their context. We talk about representative data, right? When you train something on all the internet, I mean, when you really need to tune the behavior to a particular kind of context, you do need to think about these questions, issues of privacy, Sal's mentioned, you know, safety, I mean, all these things, how, how do we, how do we uh, audit these systems? I think some of these are still the technical questions for safety for kids of different ages. There's a lot of opportunity, and I, you know, I, I am optimistic. I think these models are very expensive. I mean, for us at MIT, we spend a lot of money just to even do research with these models, so that needs to come way, way down uh, to become equitable. But even so, I think data and privacy and safety, all of these things are still gonna be important for us to be able to characterize and understand and assess. So. Again, I mean, I think there's tremendous opportunity, but we just have to do it with eyes wide open. And I think we really do have to intentionally embrace and engage these communities rather than just having it kind of happen by osmosis. So if we yeah. build it, they won't necessarily come. They won't come. necessarily come. So we have to be much more proactive and thoughtful with that. Um, right. Thank you, everyone. Please join me in thanking Sal and Cynthia.